Hi guys, it's Katya here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. In today's video, I will be sharing 5 tips for growing Ethereums. Ethereums have been a hot topic for, I would say, a past 2 years. Their popularity continues to rise and I thought I'd do some basic user-friendly tips that can help out inexperienced growers or experienced growers. It's just stuff that I found that worked for me during the time that I've been growing Ethereums, which is like a year and a half-ish to two, who knows? disease. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first tip that I want to talk about is start slow. Whether it means buying Ethereums or whether it means testing out new methods on your Ethereums. So they can be quite pricey these days, even though some of the prices have generally gone down. You still have some that are on high end and very desirable and people want to have them, but it's not really great to start with those triple digits Ethereums, especially if you're new into growing Ethereum in general. It can work out just fine, the plant will be easy going and you won't have any problems, but if it doesn't, it's gonna be a costly loss that could be avoided with trying out two or three easier Ethereums. In my opinion, I never started with the expensive ones just because I was intimidated of them and I'm glad I started out the way I did. Start off with, I think the Holy Trio is either Crystalline, Magnificum or Forgettii. Those are very forgiving Ethereums and they are pretty easy to find and also pretty cheap these days. You can also get the Clarinarium is also a great beginner Ethereum and I can say VGI is also relatively easy. You can stay in this realm, there are probably others that are easy as well, it's just the boys that everyone know. You can take your time and observe and learn new methods. For me personally, if I wanted to adjust a plant to a room conditions, I wouldn't pull out my queen that I've been proudly growing for the past, I don't know how long, feels forever. I would definitely test it on crystal hybrids, something like that, just because I know they can handle all of it and I wouldn't be too bummed if the plant wouldn't be doing great, basically just choosing test subjects. <laughs> Tip number two is to figure out the right mix. Now, there is no one right mix for all because you all have different growing conditions. It's just figuring out what works for you, what supplies you can get, because I know a lot of spaces have limited supplies of, I don't know, perlite, pumice, bark, fern. In general, what you want to opt for is an airy mix that holds moisture but still provides air pockets. The soil shouldn't be staying wet and condensated way too long because that just calls for root rot issues. So the base for any mix I think should be bark. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go down the line of peat moss. I personally haven't experienced with it if you mix it with a lot of perlite. I guess it could work but it just tends to be very compact which bark prevents. My experience bark should be your base and then you work around it regarding how much humidity you have and what temperatures because temperatures also affect the how often you have to water. How chunky you make it depends on your growing conditions. So if you have a lower humidity, the water will be evaporating more from your mix. So what you want to compensate is maybe do not put really big parts of bark inside and you can put some smaller bark inside, which at the end the mix will still be airy and moist, but the moisture will just have harder time evaporating. It's vice versa. In higher humidity, you will probably opt for bigger air pockets and bigger particles in general. I did do a detailed video on interior mix that I use, so if you want to check it out. So the tip number three is to master watering and humidity ratio. This can be challenging and even I still struggle with it. So if you have a lower humidity, the water will be evaporating faster and you will have to water more. So if you have a higher humidity in a grow tent or a greenhouse, for example, the water will be evaporating slower just because there is already so much water in the air so that the transmission from the soil and back to the air is slower. So you will also have to water less. So that's kind of how those two work together. People always ask me if you can grow Ethereums in room conditions or if you necessarily need a greenhouse for it. And the answer is no, you don't need it. You will just need to find a proper mix for your conditions and you'll have to supplement 
you love our humidity with increased watering just because the plant will be releasing more of the water into the air and you will have to supplement that with additional watering otherwise it will get crinkly in a few days tip number four not all interiors like to be root bound as this is a common saying in the plant community that i've noticed is that interiors like to be root bound and to some degree i can say that they can tolerate it well maybe better than some of the other species would even though I personally haven't had any issues with root-bound monsteras and philodendrons. Anyways, they can tolerate it well, meaning that they will still grow, their growth frequency may slow down, their leaves won't necessarily grow in size, so they can kind of stay the same or slightly decrease, so you won't be seeing a leaf increase, which is, I think, the basic thing you want with your anthurium is to get it huge. So I've had the cases of few anthuriums that just weren't growing well for me, and they weren't necessarily seriously root bound but they definitely were root bound and when I repotted them they just pushed out the biggest leaves ever this is one of the example here this is a crystal x magnifica makes something hybrid I don't know Indonesian hybrid call it whatever you want it and it has been steadily increasing with size ever since I repotted it into a relatively big pot and it has been happily growing hopefully you can see there are a lot of roots here and there and this thing is a beast and I'm not joking when I say it's a beast. It has also been flowering for me, which I figured out that I've had a crystal that just wouldn't flower for me even though it was already a decent and mature size and when I repotted it, it straight out pushed another inflow which I have successfully pollinated and it's I think working out on a second inflow. So definitely repot your anthuriums if you see some of the signs that I've mentioned before. And the last tip that I want to give out for you is to fertilize your anthuriums. I think that should be a given with any plants. Some people are still afraid to fertilize their plants. You're feeding them, they will grow, they will be happy, you will be happy. It's a win-win. From my experience, anthuriums are actually quite heavy feeders and they require higher ratio of nitrogen. So nitrogen is primarily used for tissue growth. Those boys have a lot of leaves and they use a lot of it to make them. They also require higher potassium and phosphorus level. Phosphorus is extremely important for flowers. Those are flowering plants so they definitely require a higher amount of it. Some endiriums can abort their inflow if they don't have enough nutrients so that's something to keep in mind. Be on top of your fertilizing. Whenever you have endirium that's blooming you can also so use slow fertilizer which kind of it's a backup plan whenever you forget to fertilize it doesn't matter if you're using organic or inorganic just keep in mind that with organic fertilizers it may take some time before the plant actually gets those nutrients with organic that is instant but you can get fertilizer burn so yeah i think this concludes our five tips to grow your anthuriums i will probably make more of these if i were to cram all of this in one video that would be a hell length video so till next time if you enjoyed this video please give it a like and hit that notification button and i'll see you next time bye